evening, everyone. Welcome to All The Things. I am Monique Dusan. And I am, you are? I am Krista Bontrager, also Yet known again. as Theology Mom. Still here. Still here. Welcome to another Saturday night. Yes, this is the show where we talk about all things related to God, life, and the Bible from a historically Christian perspective. Yeah, I love it that we're, we are always trying to talk about the cultural issues of the day in light of the Christian worldview. That's what I was supposed to say. Yes. That's all okay. things related to God, life, and the Bible. It's similar. Yes. I like it's written right here on the yeah, it is written. It literally is. But sometimes I just like to wing it. All right. <laughs> and helping us on the show tonight is just Bob. We're so sad. Emily went back home to Biola. Yes. Womp womp. Womp womp. But Monique has gotten out of bed. She's healed. Yes. And she's ready to roll. You haven't been here in a while. I haven't. It's been two <laughs> weeks. It has been two weeks. But I do want to say that Abby is not here tonight either because she went to a sleepover there was broom ball <laughs> yes broom ball all night broom ball on church. the ice yes the lots of group. bruises she can't hardly move yes now <laughs> she is trying to recuperate <laughs> but we do miss her yes. as well as emily and so but it's us three we're gonna hold it down tonight i know it, it's a family affair here on all the things it is and, it is and Hello to all of you. Let us know in the chat box where you're from, either um or that you're watching. Say hi. Yeah. Chat box on YouTube or um Facebook. on Facebook. Yes. Yes. And be sure to share the show. That's a great way to support the show is sh just click on that share button. Help us spread the word. Those shares really do help us because uh, the way that things work in social media land is through shares. Yes. So like, share, follow, all the things, because uh, we want to help get the word out so that other people can um, enjoy the resources that we are generating here on the show, as well as our own individual YouTube channels. Yeah, there so, it is. And right. uh, let's do a quick recap of last week's show. Okay, so I don't really know that I can do the recap. I wasn't here. Okay. But I, I was... Just watching, watching along. Yeah, um, you were on the chat box. Yes, and you were on with Rachel Shockey. Yes. From was, Women in Apologetics. She was and, uh, pin, pitch hitting for you uh, last week. She so. did very well. She <laughs> did very well. Uh, so, yeah, we had a good time talking about art and Christianity and Rachel's adventures as an artist and a Christian and um, also about using art and apologetics hmm. and her work with her traveling art exhibit that is actually coming to Biola in a couple of weeks. It's going to be part of the women in apologetics conference. And then in the second half of the show, we talked about the developments in the United Methodist church. Um, yeah. And it looks like they're going to split. Yeah. They're going to split more than likely. It's not 100% yet, but we kind of talked about some of the developments. Rachel is a lifelong Wesleyan currently attends the United Methodist Church there in Clearwater, Florida. So it's, her heart is very heavy mm -hmm. about this division and yet um, understanding the practical realities of the situation and, and kind of the line in the sand that's that's been drawn. Um, Regarding the LGBTQ. LGBT, yeah, yeah, the ordination and uh, same-sex weddings. So uh, we, that was uh, what we talked about last week. So be sure to catch the replay on uh apple podcasts google play spotify youtube yeah if you want to catch the video or the audio you can do that you, and uh just search for theology mom is where you can get the podcast yes so it uh hopefully one of my new year's goals is to get the show its own podcast stream but... well you know one step at a time <laughs> no. hey i didn't ask you i try okay how was your week? How was my week? I just jumped right in. Yeah, it was okay. Um, just getting back into the swing of things. It was a nice kind of slower pace for a couple of weeks over the holidays. Had some days off. Got to hang out with the family. Enjoyed having Emily home from college. That was Those were all really good things. Uh, January is shaping up to be a very busy month at work for me mm. and ministry-wise. So, yeah, just a lot, lot happening. You, um, you were sick. I was sick. But you yeah. started to get well, well this well. week. Yeah, and I'm glad. I'm not 100% yet, but I am definitely, like, past the 80% mark, yeah. and I'm glad about that. Um, but I don't know. Like, there's something about the holidays where it kind of feels like 
the days just all run into each other. I don't know if it's Wednesday, Saturday, <laughs> yeah. morning, night. I'm just like, yeah, here I am. And at some point, January 2nd, I'll come around and I'll go to work. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> until then, I have no idea what day it is. And I get to be in my pajamas. Well, the, we had a great time on the New Year's Eve show. That was the last time you were here because then you were kind of out of it for yes. a little while. Yeah. But we had a great time on that, on the uh, New Year's Eve show. Mm -hmm. So Laura was, Hartley called in. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we had bag. cake. We it did. was good. Who doesn't love cake? Gluten-free cake? Yes. yes. So, so, all right, good. let's do a quick rundown, rundown here of the show. What are we okay. doing? So we are going to talk about the power of storytelling. What does what power does storytelling have in culture? Is it and I was starting to ask this question. Is it that culture influences the story or does the story influence the culture? And are we seeing um, how are we seeing this all played out? We're yeah. going to um, interview Sam Lively. He wrote a book called The Trojan Mouse. Yeah. Which you did the majority of the hard work <laughs> in doing all the reading. And I did the majority of, well, I, I, I watched more cartoons than you, I think. Yeah, <laughs> you watched cartoons um, and I read the book. Yes. How it and, went. <laughs> yeah. And so, so we came together. Yeah. Um, but he he has a really unique perspective on, and, and not just the perspective, but insight into how all of this plays out. I think it's a really helpful way of just having an understanding of the role that worldviews play in movies is sometimes something we don't think about too much. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to be a good conversation later in the show. This was something we were going to do last week, but since you weren't here, we held it over to this week. Want I to appreciate to that. Yeah. I can't do it without you. Wouldn't, oh my goodness. I wouldn't be right. That would be wrong. It uh talking about some new year's goals yeah and for the show and, yeah and what people can expect from us i think it's important i mean we're we are technically a week late but yeah. you know what it's all right it, you know there was it's much still new NyQuil year's involved it's still new year's ish <laughs> it is and technically the new year doesn't start until february anyway this oh, is our okay. trial month we still have christmas lights up outside oh, and we don't need to tell all our business <laughs> <laughs> but this is January is the trial month. If you did not know, you get a do over beginning February. Yeah. This okay. is just the trial. All right. And then we have yeah, the, tweet the, the tweet of the week, of the week, which you don't know anything about. I have no idea what the tweet of the week is. I am a little nervous about that, but that's OK. I will. I'm just going to spring you know? it on her. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, let's get uh, Sam Lively on the line here and talk to him about his book, The Trojan Horse. Welcome, Sam. Hi, Krista. Hi, Monique. Hello. We're so glad to have you here. I found you on uh, John Harris's podcast, Conversations That Matter, and you were just so kind in taking a, a blind uh, media appearance. So we really are glad to have you here. And maybe you could start off by telling us a little bit about what prompted you to write your book, uh, The Trojan Mouse. Absolutely. I, uh, I decided to write The Trojan Mouse after really a lifetime worth of witnessing friends and family and acquaintances who'd been raised in the church, who had really the ideal upbringings in a lot of ways, but still um, I, I felt them drifting away from a lot of the things that we've been taught in church, we've been taught at home. And I realized, I mean, going forward that much of that was due to the priming that they were getting from the entertainment that they were consuming. And uh, so many of our, our parents had been so focused on guarding us from sex and violence and the really the overtly dangerous things in, in the stories we were consuming. And that the real danger I thought was what people were consuming in these stories themselves, the actual ideas that are, baked into narratives. And so as a result, I, I saw so many people basically primed to abandon a lot of what they were taught at home and in church as a result of what they had consumed in entertainment. And so I figured, hey, let's, let's take on the big, bad, um, giant Goliath of the industry right now, which is Disney. And uh, I think Disney is probably the most dangerous source of change for uh, Christians and conservatives in particular, uh, because it is so easy for us to embrace and so easy for us to, to not recognize um, how 
antithetical, really, and, and hostile the storytellers in the Disney apparatus have become to Christian ideas. Well, I think that's a really interesting perspective because I think you're right. As parents, oftentimes our focus is on what is overt in a movie, helping our kids stay away from sex and violence and profanity. But when it comes to a Disney movie, we're thinking, well, we're on fairly safe ground mm -hmm. here. You know, it's it's just it, it, in most cases, it's a cartoon. What could possibly go wrong? Not realizing the subtleties and the like the way that people can just slide certain things in. I think that's that's yeah, and really just it, think of it if you think of it like a um, like a, a baking form, right? So like when you when you make cookies, right? You can you put everything in a certain shape, and and then that's the way it's going to enter the consumer. That's that's really how storytelling works. Is if you are going to create a certain form, it's going to say certain things about the way life works. And if that form doesn't match up with what you've been taught at, at home and at church, then it has the possibility over time, not instantaneously, of, of changing you, of, of changing that form inside you to, to fit what you're consuming. And I think that's the danger that a lot of people don't take seriously. And I think, I, uh, yeah, I, I think that was a point that I really wanted, I want to make sure that our, our viewers are catching because it is so important. I, I think that you make this very thoughtful point of how worldviews come through movies because storytelling is just a natural part of, I think, what it means to be created in the image of God. We are natural born storytellers. And so when we see people in the broader culture engaging in, in storytelling and myth making, that's just an expression of who they are and who they've been created to be. Mm -hmm. And in that fallen nature, maybe their stories aren't shaped by the Christian worldview. But then the question is, is how do those myths and the storytelling then shape us as the viewer? It, it, it conditions us to think in ways that we may not be aware of what's happening. Right. And if you think, if you think in terms of, of causes and consequences, heroes and villains, um, good and evil. These are all things that every single story that you consume has something to say on. And some of those stories are going to conform with, again, what you were taught at home and what you're taught at church. And some of them are actually going to contradict them. And it's, it's very difficult sometimes for people to realize when that's happening because the whole joy of, of, of consuming a story is suspending your disbelief and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let go and I'm going to go where the storyteller wants to take me and I'm going to have a fun time. And I mean, that's, that is the, uh, the, the appeal. So as a result, a lot of people take down their, the natural barriers that they'd have for somebody who say knocked on the door and handed them a, a tract and said, Hey, come to, uh, come join my church. And instead of having those barriers up and they're, they, they've suspended that disbelief and they, they follow them wherever the story goes. And that could be to a place where heroes look completely different from the way they were taught, where good and evil are reversed. Um, anything um, is possible in that new story. And if you consume enough uh, stories that fit those, that different kind of worldview, eventually I, I believe that you're going to feel a lot of your sympathies start to change. Where you're, when you encounter a real life story, you're going to start seeing the heroes and the villains in the same way that the stories that you've watched and that you've consumed have depicted them. And so that means that's the person who is standing up against oppressive patriarchy or oppressive morality, right? As the hero, you're going to be naturally sympathetic to that person in real life because that's that's who you've seen be the hero in everything you've watched since you were five years old. So yeah. it, it's definitely powerful. So then do you, like in looking at myths and the shaping of culture and things like that, do you see myths playing a role in shaping culture and um, like our values and norms, or are they just reflecting what's already there? Well, it's definitely both, but it's important to, to, re to respect how, how much they can shape. Um, if you think of it like, well, first of all, you have to understand that storytelling is the language of the heart, right? The heart speaks in stories. And so it's going to store most moral lessons in story form. That could be what you have, uh, what you've seen in your family. I mean, you store memories of stories, but it's also in what you consume as, um, as fictional stories. And so 
the shaping comes over time. And so sometimes stories are just going to reflect broader truths and broader values that you've already consumed elsewhere. But there's going to be certain powerful new stories that are going to challenge um, existing uh, assumptions, existing values. And if those gain enough traction, they can um, generate a lot of imitators who then reinforce those new values. And, uh, and as a result, that, that shapes, that can lead to a, a, a paradigm shift, a landscape um, shift, where you have a, a brand new set of values. And so it's not always going to be um, shaping. Sometimes it will be reflecting, but there are definitely sort of these big moments in storytelling and in, in cultural phenomena that, uh, that lead to a shaping of new values, new beliefs. And uh, we're, we're in the midst of one right now. Um, yeah, and we'll the, get yeah. into that uh, as we go along here. And so it, one of the points I hear you making is that as Christian parents, we we got to help our kids kind of not only navigate the overt things they see on the screen, but also the the heart issues that come up because so much of storytelling, especially filmmaking and my background, I don't know if we've ever mentioned this on the show before, mm -hmm. but um, my undergraduate degree in, is in filmmaking. And so I know a little bit about that world and so much of storytelling in the filmmaking industry is about you want to capture the viewer's emotions so that you can lead them on a changing journey that you're taking them from. Maybe they have this point of view um, and then you're, you're trying to lead them on a journey to having a different point of view. And they, they do that through the character um, that they identify with. And so there is a, a version of capturing the heart. And so we as Christian parents have to help our kids not only navigate the discernment of what they're overtly watching, but also what their mind is thinking and how their emotions are being captured through the, the film process as well. I think it's a very powerful point that you're making there, Sam. Yeah. And it's, I mean, I wrote the book on movies in particular, but it's all, it's important to understand this applies to all narrative forms of storytelling, because again, it's narrative is the emotional language of the heart. And so it's, it's very powerful because instead of, trying to assault people with, with arguments and intellectual uh, cases for a certain new belief or new value, you're actually calling the heart out to participate. Uh, the analogy I used in the book is the magic carpet from Aladdin, because really that's what a, um, a consumer is doing, is they're going with the storyteller into a whole new world. And they're being, their heart is leaving the defenses, right? They're leaving that, that castle of, of beliefs and values that's been built around them and it's leaving to go potentially find something new. And so if you, if you recognize that every time you're consuming a narrative, you're being invited out of your, um, your existing belief system and potentially going somewhere that could contradict everything that you believe. Uh, if you recognize that, if you recognize it as a voyage out of your own beliefs, I think that is going to be one of the first keys in, in, uh, being a good critical consumer who is not necessarily going to be, uh, swept off their feet uh, by the experience. Yeah, that's a good word. Well, let's, let's get into like kind of your framework that you lay out in the book, um, just in some broad strokes of, you, you kind of have this idea that there is kind of two thought movements in a lot of the Disney movies of loyalists and revolutionaries. So maybe we could kind of define that framework and then maybe we'll talk about a couple of, of big examples to, to help flush that out. So let's talk about defining those terms, the loyalists and the revolutionaries. Right. I, I use those terms because I don't like how um, vague and politically charged a lot of the, the usual culture war terms, left versus right, conservatives versus liberals. Uh, it just, it's very hard to define those sometimes when it comes down to seeing who's actually standing where. And so the, the loyalist versus revolutionary um, idea is instead of thinking instead of sides, you're actually dealing more with a, a center, a center of values and beliefs that are based off of what um, the, the American people have used to treasure, right? So it's a Christian heritage that is based off of Christian ideas of, of good and evil and the mythology that was built up 
around those ideas. And some, some of those are not going to be explicitly Christian. That's why I, I refer to it as loyalism, because you're, you're going to include people who aren't necessarily Christian, but are loyal to the culture and loyal to the um, foundational beliefs that, that make, that made America possible, that, that make um, sort of the, the morality, the conventional American morality possible. So people who are loyal to that, loyal to the structures that make that possible are loyalists. And then everyone outside of that loyalist center would be someone who's a revolutionary, somebody who wants to overthrow that center and replace it. And usually revolutionaries are going to be motivated by some type of grievance. They're going to see themselves as oppressed. Um, a coalition of the fringes is what one uh, blogger referred to it as. And so it's, if you think of people who are, are trying to overthrow people in the center, trying to re, um, revolt and, and, and put in a new power structure that is based off of bringing all the people who have been uh, rejected and defined as evil or um, or sinful by the previous order, they're all going to be able to make common cause in, um, in overthrowing or redefining the loyalist center. Okay, so... I hear, I hear what you're saying and I hear the definitions, but how do we, like when we bring that to a practical um, example, sure. how would we see that in a, a movie like Snow White? Because Snow White's kind of the yeah. quintessential first big animated picture. I think it was in the 30s that it came out. Right. And Snow White is also pre-modern uh, culture war, but it's, it's definitely what I would consider a loyalist movie. Uh, a loyalist um, foundational pillar is the idea of, of Christian values, right? And Snow White is very much a Christian allegory. And you have the, you have the prince and you have the princess, right? You have the sort of Christ-like redeemer and a um, cursed bride, right? In need of redemption. So the, it's a very abstract, very ethereal um, version. And of course it has some pagan influence in there too, but at its heart, it's very much that that redemption arc of somebody of, of Snow White being somebody who is is cursed, somebody who is is beset by an accuser. In this case, the the evil stepmother slash queen, right? And so, who's, who's going to pursue her and hunt her and bring her under the curse, and ultimately succeeds in in a uh, a narrative form that's very similar to the Garden of Eden. She eats a forbidden fruit and ends up dead. Right, and she can only be brought back to life by the the kiss and the marriage uh, to the handsome prince, right? Who then sort of escorts her up to this castle in the skies. And I mean, if you can't see the Christian symbolism there, I mean, it's it's all there. It's all very intentional. All this is based off of many many years of myths that uh, were inspired by the Bible and were were meant to reinforce the values. Of, of a Christian civilization. So I would consider Snow White a classic example of a, of a loyalist um, uh, story with very, very traditional values and, and, a, and a strong place for a Christian moral view of, of sin and redemption. And not to mention that it's highly patriarchal. You know, the, the man is the rescuer, the woman is in distress. She's the one who needs rescuing. She's kind of weak. Um, we see in her uh, a weakness and a powerlessness, very different than the more recent Disney heroines. So, you know, that's also part of the loyalist structure is the traditional patriarchalism right. um, and looking at kind of the cultural values that we, um, you might more closely associate with, with traditional yeah, and, and Christianity. You if you see how Snow White expresses her strengths, right? She comes in and she cleans house and she cooks and she sort of domesticates these um, wild men in, a, in the dwarves. And so as, as a result, she, she is, she has strengths, but they, they very much fit within that, um, the traditional gender roles that were celebrated um, prior to the current culture war. So do you think that that was intentional on Walt Disney's part? Was he trying to, really create films that reinforced this loyalist ideas. Another big theme that you brought out in your book was um, patriotism and the love of, of, of America. That was another big theme in a lot of Walt Di earlier on Walt Disney movies. Do you think that was intentional on Walt Disney's part? Uh, yeah, definitely. I mean, Walt Disney is a 
complicated man. So I don't want to, um, don't want to, um, create a misrepresentation of necessarily, but yes, there was definitely intentionality there. Uh, if you understand the, the context of those early Disney movies, uh, communism and a, a very, very secular way of viewing life was, uh, was being promoted, especially with the great depression, shaking a lot of people's faith in the old American way. And so Disney was this sort of wellspring of optimism and hope and and true belief in the in the Christian principles and the in the social structures that um, that he had inherited, and so he's he's really creating these kind of um, tracks that are 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 preserving the the vision that uh, that they inherited as Americans, right? The, this is this is the beauty of what we've inherited. These are the the values and the teachings that we've inherited, and, and aren't they great? And so he was really celebrating those with a lot of his early films. And if you sort of read between the lines, you can see a rebuke to a lot of the challenges that were coming from Europe and from the sort of the more cynical, um, nihilistic or modernistic or, or pleasure-seeking um, kind of uh, offshoots that were starting to emerge as rivals to the dominant loyalist or Christian tradition. And I don't want to give away too much in the book, but that those are some other things that you you explore in in your book. So, um, did you want to jump in? Yeah, but I was gonna bring it more toward today. Yeah, like okay, so that was in the '30s. How do we see you know this coming forward today? Like, I know Walt Disney dies. I don't even know he when dies he in, died. The, in the in the '60s. <laughs> okay, before and- my time. And then there was kind of a rough yes. period in the 70s and 80s. But where- then it seems like, I guess they got like more of a resurgence yeah. and and kind of like their own little... In the early 90s, the, which you, you see like The Little Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin as kind of the big three that started to turn Disney around. So maybe talk to us about some of the, the patterns that you see there where the revolutionaries kind of come into the picture. Right. The, I mean, through the 60s, late 60s, early 70s, uh, you had sort of an adrift Disney. Without Walt at, in control, they really didn't know what to do. And so the natural drift was towards surrounding Hollywood. And so they ended up bringing in uh, a guy named Michael Eisner, who in turn brought in uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg. Um, and they, the, that dynamic duo had great success in bringing back um, artistic excellence, innovation, um, fun back into Disney movies. Um, But with it, they brought a completely different value system. And so you see really starting, um, it took them a few years to find their way, but you see really starting in uh, with The Little Mermaid when they brought in a guy named Howard Ashman, who was a Broadway playwright and songwriter who kind of created the new formula that would become the the Disney Renaissance, which was these very emotional teenage anthems that appealed directly to the heart, right? That sought to liberate the heart and make the uh, the heart the ruler of the uh, of the moral universe of Disney, which is was very unusual for um, Disney stories. If you go back to Pinocchio um, and like Jimmy Jiminy Cricket and the conscience, right? They always always you go back to these sort of ideas that there's a discipline, there's a moral discipline that's necessary, and that trusting your heart is going to lead you astray. Well, that began to change with the Disney Renaissance because now it was the teenage heart that was the, uh, that was the guiding moral voice. And it, that voice was going to eventually pull Disney into that revolutionary orbit where um, pleasure seeking, where um, resisting anyone who is going to get in the way of self-fulfillment and, um, and, and, any type of um, of pagan or or uh, or anti patriarchal kind of sentiment was going to become fair game as the Disney Renaissance progressed, and we got into movies like Beauty and the Beast and Aladdin and Pocahontas, and on into the, the late nineties. So, uh, I wanted to ask a question about patriarchalism. Is that okay? Yeah. All right. So, like, let's look at Beauty and the Beast because that's the one I'm the most familiar with. I went. My husband and I actually went and saw that movie on a date when we were dating, like back in 91. 
So I'm most familiar with that, with that film. And Mm -hmm. um, I thought your comments were really interesting about Beauty and the Beast and how it's sort of the seeds of what we now call smash the patriarchy. So maybe you can kind of outline that for us a little bit more. Sure. And it's, it's best to understand that you kind of have to use Little Mermaid as a companion to really understand how uh, significant the change was for Beauty and the Beast. Um, so if you start with King Triton in Little Mermaid, the father figure, extremely patriarchal. I mean, he's, he's sort of a divine figure. He's got this big, huge, white patriarchal beard, these huge muscles. He's got the scepter of power and authority. And it's really the story is about the, um, the, the wannabe matriarch, Ursula, trying to overthrow him. Now, then you jump ahead one movie chronologically to Beauty and the Beast, and who do we have as the father figure in this one? It's a, it's Maurice. He's this short, fat, completely incompetent and hopeless um, personality who I, I think in the three scenes that he's, um, he's prominent in, he knocks himself out, he gets himself thrown into prison, and then he gets himself thrown into an insane, insane asylum. So you have this... Um, uh, smashing the patriarchy, it's not necessarily mean-spirited. He's not, a, he's not a bad guy, but he is removed. He's removed from the equation. And as a result, who has to step forward? Who has to become the moral leader? And it is, the, it is Bell. It is Bell who is motivated by this, by sort of this romance novel um, mentality, right, of being the strong, independent woman who has to tame this very handsome, um, noble, and sort of bend him to her will. And so it's a, it's a, it can be sort of a subtle shift for, I think, for some people, but you have to understand that that, that patriarchy that was, that was the, the guardian of the old order is very subtly moved out of the way, put it into the loony bin, so that now Bell can emerge to become the savior figure, to become the leading moral voice for the new generation of Disney movies. Go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Go ahead. Make you go on. All right. So that was helpful. Um, now I'm curious. Do you see the loyalists and the revolutionary framework playing out in any non-Disney movies, or do you see that mostly as a as a unique feature of Disney films? Oh, it's certainly not unique to Disney. Um, this is something that has been going on. This is the culture war. It's been going on uh, in movies since the early 1960s, but it's in Disney that you see it take its most effective form. Because if you look at the success rate of Disney movies, and not just the, the financial success rate, but people were basically raised on movies like Beauty and the Beast, where they would just put on, kids would put on the movie and then watch it like five times in one week. Um, so you really had a enormous cultural impact, I think, from the Disney versions of revolutionary ideas that had far more cultural traction than anything else really that Hollywood has done. I mean, the only thing comparable that I can see um, for my generation would be James Cameron's uh, Titanic uh, and Avatar movies. I mean, but beyond that, really it's, it's Disney. Disney's been the, the big cheese on the, on the stage for quite a while. Okay. So, um, we got some comments here. Should we go to the comments? <laughs> yes. I, I do have a question. I'll just, you know, I'll, hold, right. I'll hold it for one minute. No, go ahead. Sure. Go ahead. no let's go to the question. comments. Let's right. see. Because there's a couple of good ones in here. Yeah. All right. So let's uh, go to um, Jeremy, a uh, frequent viewer, says, can you ask the guest what he thinks of the subtle differences in worldview between the 1991 version of Beauty and the Beast and the recent live action remake. Yeah, I've I've seen the uh, both of those. Um, I thought that the um, the remake was quite loyal to the spirit of of the original and to its its messaging. So I didn't see um, any major differences. Um, Linda Wolverton was the screenwriter behind Beauty and the Beast. She's a very um, proud and very uh, aggressive revolutionary feminist. Um, and so they were very loyal to the spirit that she introduced those characters. Really the only thing that you're going to notice as a big difference is the um, sort of slavishly political 
correctness of the new era. So they're going to be very conscious of, of how they are doing racial diversity in um, like 18th century France, I think is the setting. And yet there are suddenly like a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, African or um, I, I don't know, like there's racial diversity in, in 18th century France. So it's like, there's a sort of a Hamilton, if you have anyone familiar with that Broadway, there's gonna yeah. be that sort of new approach, but really they're very loyal to the spirit of, uh, of, the, uh, of the original. The big difference, if you wanna see a big difference between live action and original, watch The Jungle Book. John Favreau's The Jungle Book completely changes the entire moral structure of the 1967 original to fit with the new ideology where you have you it's very much about dismantling the idea of man over nature and putting nature over man in the new uh in the new jungle they were very intentional about that john favreau spoke and um, is it because that would have been another I, I think if i remember right jungle book was the last movie that walt disney supervised before his death yes okay and so the Kind of the loyalist last animated movie. The last the animated right. movie. Okay, and th so the loyalist aspect of the Jungle Book would be man triumphing over nature, but right. the, the from a revolutionary standpoint, now it's it's sort of the reverse of that. Right. It's the sort of it takes a village, all of the animals banding together to uh, and and Mowgli deciding to stay with the animals instead of joining the man village which was the big moment at the end of the original has completely changed in the new one. So yeah, Beauty and the Beast, because it was revolutionary, a, a, new, um, a new version doesn't have to make significant changes because it fits within, it reflects their moral narrative. Whereas some, taking something from that golden age, they're going to have to completely break it um, to make it fit. Malevolent, or sorry, not Malevolent, uh, <laughs> Maleficent uh, is another great example of that. A complete destruction of Sleeping Beauty um, to make it fit with the new moral uh, narrative. So that kind of brings me to the question that I'm, that I had was in the beginning, we talked about like, are, is the story shaping the culture? Is the culture shaping the story? And you said it was a bit of both, or it could be a bit of both um, and myths shaping, but are the writers now, do you think deliberately trying to write in accordance with this culture shaping mindset or are they on the back end writing to back up what's happening in culture? Well, it's again, they're trying to reinforce what victories the revolutionaries have had in other spheres. Um, but they're also trying to carry it forward. They're trying to shape um, people who have not previously been um, reached with that messaging. So, um, definitely, they're, they're trying, they're intentionally trying to shift people to a, a new moral perspective. And um, they, they've been doing so. Linda Wolverton was one of the most aggressive. Um, Howard Ashman, uh, the, the, uh, the original songwriter and, and, uh, and sort of playwright who, who created the Disney Renaissance template, they very much wanted Disney to lead the way towards a more revolutionary future. And so I, I would definitely take them at their word when they talk about how much they wanted to shake things up because mm -hmm. they did. I mean, a lot of, an entire generation, I think, has been shifted, maybe some majorly, some minorly, but has been shifted significantly uh, to the, uh, what we would view as the left of major cultural issues as a result of having consumed and loved those characters. Well, well let's skip ahead. So we had the, the kind of the Disney Renaissance in the nineties. Now let's kind of skip forward again to a, the next major shift, if you will. And you bring up the movie Wreck-It Ralph, which Monique watched last night. And uh, we, I watched the second half of it today. And so then your kind of your um, theory is that, now the filmmakers at Disney are starting to bring in aspects of critical theory. So maybe you can kind of walk us through how you see that in the movie Wreck-It Ralph. Right, right. I mean, it's not enough to smash the patriarchy. You have to put something in its place. And so if you look at Wreck-It Ralph, Wreck-It Ralph, um, chronologically 2012, it's at the beginning of what 
people have called the great awakening. So woke ideology starting to become uh, mainstreamed. And so if you look at Wreck-It Ralph, Wreck-It Ralph tackles um, not directly, but indirectly race and gender issues. So if you look at Wreck-It Ralph, Wreck-It Ralph is a white working class hero, but he's not actually a hero. His heroism comes in recognizing his place in the new intersectional hierarchy, right? Which is that in a systemically racist and white supremacist um, society, the, um, the white male patriarch, right, has to be the bad guy. He has to be the bad guy. He's, even if he isn't individually bad, he has to recognize that his people, right, are the, the cause, are the original sin, the original source of evil in the world. And so wreck and Ralph's journey, his narrative journey, is one of realizing that he cannot be the hero. He has to be willing to be the bad guy so that the rest of society can function. And if you look at who the villain, the, the true villain, um, if other than wreck and Ralph, is this character, um, King Candy, who, um, spoiler alert, becomes, is revealed to be Turbo, this, um, this previously dominant um, and of course, old white male, right, who has refused to accept being passed on um, and, and replaced by this young female princess and has instead usurped her power and installed himself as the, um, as the ruler of the, of, the, of the game world, right? So Ralph's journey is realizing that he can't be like that guy. He cannot go turbo and, and stay in and, and, and usurp power. Right? But he's got to instead be content to be the bad guy and step aside to allow a, um, a, uh, a young woman now to be the ruler, to be, to be the moral leader and guardian of the, of the new society. And so that, that, is, that is completely in line with the new um, critical theory and especially the, the, this idea that white supremacy is is responsible for all the evils in modern society. Monique's getting she's yes, her head I'm over just, here. Just given the head nod because I I could see that like in Wreck It Ralph, I um I saw all of the critical theory, critical race theory kind of um um ideology in Zootopia even more. We're gonna get to Zootopia. Yes. Oh <laughs> that one. But yeah, I can totally see that and just um how in that movie, like he either needs to accept the the way the world is, or I mean, what is what was the other option? Right. You know, his, you his game at, actually being shut down. Right. And if you look at Wreck It Ralph, Wreck It Ralph is sort of the gender, mostly the gender side of it, and then Zootopia is the is the, the more the racial side of it. But if you look at if you look at the subplot in Wreck It Ralph, the uh, the uh, the very muscular butch military woman whose love interest is this effeminate, like two foot tall uh, <laughs> little guy. Felix. Right? And his, the yeah. big love scene between them is when she punches him yes. like repeatedly in the face um, uh, for everyone else's entertainment. He can fix himself. But that's, again, that's, it's the new orientation. It's this, this idea that if you're the, the white male patriarch, your only way of, of, uh, of, maintaining your place in society is by taking abuse, right? Is by taking abuse so that other people can rise. And so that is the, um, it, it, it's, it's remarkable. I, I'm not sure how much of it was intentional, but it's, it's so naked once you, uh, once you peel back some of the, the more entertaining layers that, I mean, I, I really do believe that was intentional, especially once you see the, the follow-up. wreck it Ralph's sequel was even more overt. And some of the other works, and I'm sure we're going to talk about Zootopia. Yeah, well, let's talk. Let's talk about Frozen first, since the second okay. Frozen just came out. Let's, and that's kind of the next one in the sequence, and then we'll get to Zootopia. And I'm okay with spending a little more time on these movies because these are sort of more recent, and our viewers are kind of familiar with some themes of critical theory that we um, often talk about on the show. So let's talk about Frozen. How do you see aspects of critical theory playing out in in that film? Well, Frozen is about, um, it's, it's uniting the old Renaissance idea of, um, of following your heart, right? Of, of, of finding your inner power. Um, 
and then it's it's uniting that with this this idea that the the source of all evil is the the white patriarchy. So it's building up the the princess away from someone who's being redeemed and now to becoming the redeemer, right? And so Elsa has to make this journey uh, where she's initially castigated as the as the villainess, right? As the source of evil. But what she discovers, and this runs directly contrary to the, the source material, the Snow Queen, um, what she discovers is that she's not actually evil. She is actually loving. Her sin nature is actually a superpower. And the real source of evil in this world is the Prince Charming archetype, Prince Hans, who is manipulating his, uh, his love interest, Princess Anna, um, using all of her past fairy tale myths to, um, to build for himself this sort of untouchable reputation. And then using that, using that to exploit and and uh, oppress and and to seize power that is not his own. So it's it's got that that same Wreck It Ralph um, idea of this white patriarch trying to usurp and overtake sort of the natural matriarchy and make them feel guilty, make them feel as if there's something wrong with them, make them feel as if as if Eve did something wrong by biting into that apple, right? And, uh, and instead, their, their ultimate triumph is rejecting that, saying, no, we are fit to rule. We are, um, we are good. We are uh, naturally good. And if we embrace sort of our inner goddess, we will, we will rise and we'll lead our civilization to much higher um, and much freer um, places than, than, than white male patriarchs ever got us. Do you want to comment on that? No, go ahead. Okay. Sorry, I was just, I was in the comments too. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Um, I want to get to Zootopia and then we'll get to some more comments because we're, we're getting some good feedback here. And so I want to encourage people uh, to jump in there if you have questions for our guest. Let's talk a little about Zootopia because Monique and I saw critical race theory all, all over that. Movie. Everywhere. Everywhere else. Is, I was like, wow, here it is everywhere. All the way down to um, the bunny Somebody called the bunny cute and the bunny was like, no, only other bunnies can use that word. I was like, <laughs> it was everywhere. Yes, definitely. I mean, and Zootopia is interesting because it's, it's kind of a little bit confused. Um, so you have, I mean, this intersectionality is, is usually about creating this very strict hierarchy of, of who's the oppressed and who's the oppressor. And Zootopia gets a little mixed up because the bunny is both the, um, oppressed, right? Because people look down at her because she's small and cute, right? And so she has that initial um, idea, but it's also, she's part of the oppressor class. Yes. Ultimately from there, is that the, the prey animals, right? Being the majority are using fear, um, using the sort of uh, racist hypothesis that predators might be dangerous, right? And, uh, and using that to uh, maintain political power and, uh, and create a climate of fear where they can uh, avoid losing to their predator political rivals. I, I think the idea of intersectionality there in that movie was w between the bunny and he was a fox. Because the fox, right. Yeah. So you, you get like the fox who is a predator, but is also being oppressed by the bunny because of her position as a police right. officer. So she's being oppressed and her intersection would be that, you know, she's a female and she's a bunny, but yet she oppresses the fox because of his position just in society. Nobody, she has her fox spray. And <laughs> I, I yes. Was, it, yeah. If you look at it too, in, in terms of, because the, the key, the key, to understanding why critical theory is so important. I mean, a utop utopia is supposed to have arisen. According to the revolution, right? We're, if we overthrew this oppressive loyalist center, all these oppressive Christian ideas, this oppressive social institution of patriarchy, if all this is gone, if the revolutionary is in power, why isn't everything great? And so that is the, the question that Zootopia is trying to answer. Why isn't this a utopia? And if you look and find out and find out in the story, why isn't it a utopia yet? 
it's because of this lingering remnant of supremacy, right? This conspiracy of supremacists who are framing, right? They are framing the predators for, um, for crimes that they didn't commit. They're creating uh, these old um, enmities that we were supposed to have grown beyond. They're, they're bringing them back deliberately um, so they can maintain power. So it's, it's very explicit uh, critical theory, right? This idea that structural white supremacy is the ultimate threat and that you have to continue digging deeper and deeper and deeper. And then eventually you'll find this, this conspiracy, this root. And once you get rid of that, right, then people can actually live in harmony and the revolution can, can finally give everyone what it promised. Very good. Well, we're going to go yeah. out to YouTube here and take a few comments. Um, our friend Rachel Shockey, who was um, the artist on our show last week, has a couple of questions. She's really big into myth making and storytelling. She's a big Lewis and Tolkien fan. And so she has a couple comments. When we engage with the arts, we can appreciate the art form and the art itself, but we should ask it uh, if what is said, if what is trying to be conveyed is true. So that's a, that's a really good point. And then she also um, kind of had a counterpoint to something you said earlier is sure. there are many stories that weren't created by those with a Christian worldview, yet the moral law can still be found in them and the story can highlight good versus evil. So I don't know Absolutely. if you want to re react to either of those comments. Well, I mean, I like to go off of, uh, I think it's uh, Luke 950, the idea that whoever isn't against us, right, it can be for us. And that's the, that's the idea. If somebody is not actively trying to um, undermine a Christian worldview, um, chances are they could actually be reinforcing it. So there, there's definitely, it's not about, is this person a Christian who's telling you the story? Uh, even Christians can tell very dangerous stories if they're, uh, if they're coming at it from a, the wrong place. So it's, it's really just much about taking each story as it comes and seeing what sort of truth claims are being made, seeing what sort of, uh, who's being positioned as the hero, what sort of consequences are, are being meted out. Is there, is there redemption? Who's providing the redemption? Um, all those kind of things are going to be the tells for what a story is actually um, saying, not who actually told the story. Uh, one more question here from a YouTube watcher. Uh, our friend Jeremy says, Disney bought Lucasfilm and Marvel uh, to go with the boys. What do you make of the fact that Star Wars seems to have turned its back on that goal? Do you have any thoughts about where the Star Wars franchise is going since its Disney acquisition? Yeah, well, Star Wars and Marvel are both being gradually brought into the same uh, moral universe that Disney has occupied for the last 30 years. Um, you've seen that with the new trilogy. Um, again, a lot of the same themes um, on display with the uh, the smashing of the patriarchy. The um, and again, Marvel is starting to do it with with the Captain Marvel character. Um, and I'm I'm sure as they continue, they're going to be um, having to confront their own past their own uh, sinful past and from the revolutionary perspective and sort of retcon a lot of those stories to bring them um, into the correct moral orbit. Uh, I, I didn't go into those in the book. I did Pixar as an appendix. I'll probably eventually do a Marvel and a Star Wars appendix as well. But if you look at what's happening with Pixar now, um, with Toy Story 4 um, and uh, some of the other more recent Pixar movies, you can see how they've basically gone in and restructured a lot of those old narratives to make them fit the new either critical theory um, perspective or just the, the old follow your heart sort of revolutionary heathenism of the Disney Renaissance. Well, go ahead. well with the importance of storytelling, I feel like that's been the thread through throughout is that stories are like, that's how the heart captures things. That's how the heart retells things. How can right. Christians use their voice and contribute more to storytelling? Well, we have to become storytellers. I mean, that's one of the big problems that a lot of um, Christian capital, um, and I'm not talking about money necessarily, but just a lot of best Christian minds 
are going into intellectual pursuits. Um, apologetics are great, but um, just like politics is downstream from culture, I think a lot of the um, mindset is downstream from emotional conception. And so I think we definitely need to invest more in our own storytellers and our own creative people to get them working on, on things that benefit, um, that advance the kingdom, right? Not just, um, not just say, Hey, we got seminary and we got a few, we got like three or four Christian colleges that'll, they'll help you out with this, but then you're going to probably end up having to work in Hollywood and have to work for somebody else's vision to, to do all the, uh, the hard work of becoming a good artist, working for people who are openly hostile to your beliefs. So I think definitely as, as a, as a culture, we definitely need to um, invest more in our own storytellers to encourage more Christians to go into the field and then to reward them when they do, even if the early productions aren't that great, um, just to, 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 to pay it forward, to, to give something now so that we can have a better um, presence in the, on the cultural front in the next 10, 20 years. I couldn't agree with you more. Um, I completely see that when, like, as I, as you were talking, the person that came to mind for me um, was Tyler Perry. And just mm -hmm. like how, when he started out, I, I used to be so diehard, like Tyler Perry and not to, you know, villainize him or say that he's not doing great work now because he's doing some amazing stuff now, but mm -hmm. it does have more of that cultural bend to it, more of that, what I would call secular feel to it. Um, and like the stories are not those Christian stories that he used to come out with that um, even for like black culture was mm -hmm. very, you know, overtly Christian. Now I feel right. it, it's more like, you know, this is what's going to sell. This is what's going to bring in money. And unfortunately it's because people weren't paying. They weren't contributing to him in that vision and supporting that. And so I think what you're saying is so important that we need to be behind one another so that we can continue to tell the stories that are important and that will, you know, shape the heart and the culture. Yeah, and I, th I think there's there's three steps that every Christian can make. Not everybody's going to become a storyteller, but everybody can make the journey from a passive consumer, somebody who just watches, right? Someone who just pays money and watches and consumes and is transformed by the experience without resisting, right? So we can make that first step. Everybody can make that first step to becoming a critical consumer, somebody who doesn't just suspend their disbelief because they want to be entertained to the fullest but rather somebody who's actually going to be view it as a potentially um, life altering experience and to respect the medium and go in there with your guard up as a, as an opponent of the storyteller, if they're not, um, if they're not coming from the same worldview that you are. And so again, you can still have an enjoyment of the experience while keeping your guard up. So that critical, that, that first step is to become the critical consumer. And then the, the most critical one from the, for a broader cultural standpoint is, is what you're talking about, which is being the, the investor consumer, somebody who recognizes that they have a voice just like a voter does in a democracy in a capitalist entertainment driven economy. You vote with your money. You vote with your investment in somebody else's vision. And if you are sending all of your money, if you are sending, spending all of your time talking and promoting and um, and adding more spotlight to um, productions that are hostile um, to your worldview, then guess what you're going to get more of, right? You're going to get a lot more of the same. Whereas if you actively seek out or even crowdfund, you know, um, stuff that can be different, you're going to start to see more um, viable alternatives. That's, that's some good advice. And I, I do want to let people know, once again, if they want to get connected with you, they can go to your Facebook page, The Trojan Mouse, and you, you and your wife put together Disney dossiers on a lot of Disney movies just to help um, people be a discerning consumer. Yeah. And um, I know that you're not anti-Disney, that rather what you're trying to do is help equip Christians to think about these things carefully and, and to have those critical conversations with their kids, with their teens, 
to help them discern what they're seeing and how their worldviews are being shaped by these movies. Right. There's no escaping it. I mean, I respect the people, the, the Baptist boycott of the 90s. I, I see what they were trying to do. They were trying to take a stand. Um, but I that's not how I've chosen to approach it. I think it's got to be, we've got to be proactive in the way that we engage the culture. And you have to understand what's popular. You have to be able to consume without being consumed. And then you have to go out and try to use your consumption to uh, foster something that is a, a viable alternative, a viable counter to the dominant culture right now. So go watch things, but don't be transformed them by them and start to think more strategically. Start to think about what world you want to see in 10 years and what entertainment products you want to have for your kids and start to invest in those in whatever way you can. Okay, well, thanks for joining us, Sam. And uh, we're just having a little back and forth. Right. You know, you know, so sometimes just... they switch to the camera and, you know, we still talking. <laughs> That's all right. Oh, mine does. Well, thanks, Sam, for coming. And I'm hoping that uh, people will check out your book and, and uh, yeah. your, your efforts there on Facebook and uh, avail themselves of the, the dossiers that you've, you and your wife work on uh, to help us be better consumers of disney so thank you so much for taking the time to talk to us very important work thank you thanks so much for having me have a good night okay that was good that was good i I think um it makes me think about my years as a children's pastor Mm. and the the movies that kids would watch and their actions you know after they've watched this movie and just watching their own minds kind of unravel or grapple with these concepts and at that time you know it was interesting to watch and i had my own thoughts about it but since you know listening to another interview that sam did and hearing your takeaways from the book i'm like wow you know it was it it's bigger than what i even gave it credit for then yeah it's it's it, i found it very helpful so i'm i'm glad we had the conversation i don't know so much about storytelling, but I have three people in my family who loved art, art and storytelling. So it helps me kind of appreciate how they think. And, and like tying back into the conversation last week with Rachel, I think that so much can, Christians can do a lot mm-hmm. to be thoughtful about how we're putting forward artistic creations and helping people think ab- about their lives and doesn't have to be just from a secular point of view. Like we could have a voice, we could do some things and, and trying to dream for the next generation of what their voice could be. So yeah. Yeah. Very cool. All right. Happy new year. Happy new year. Are you ready to talk about some goals? Yes. Let's do a little, a little goal work. Yes. Well, what can, uh, let's check out the, uh, Our friend Jeremy, who I'm pretty sure is a youth pastor, um, says one of the most important things adults can do is talk to kids about the movies they see, get them thinking and talking. And you're so right, Jeremy. I used to do, when I was young, I used to do a talk. Back in the day when I was young, I'm not... I Never mind. If you know that, that song, if you know that song, then you know that song. <laughs> Sorry. So you know, I am a work in progress. The Lord is not through with me yet, people. He he promises transformation. <laughs> Sorry. Now back to my point. Sorry. <laughs> and I do have one. Uh, so, not a youth pastor. I teach oh, junior high Sunday school. Okay. That's sort of the same thing, but maybe not officially paid staff. But anyways, um, I used to do a talk of using world, using movies to teach young people about worldviews. Because if you just stand up there and you do a talk on worldviews, it's sort of dry. But what I would do is take popular movies and clips from the movies to illustrate how a worldview works and how it how it's shows up in movies. And that was always a, a very powerful talk. Um, I enjoy doing that, but I'm, I'm not so young anymore and I don't know popular movies anymore. <laughs> But okay. All right. Let's talk about the the new year. Let's talk about some goals on the show and what people can expect from us. There are just so many songs running through my head right oh. now. <laughs> do, you, do we need to turn it into a song show? No, oh, because okay. I can't sing. That'd be horrible. No one should be subjected to that. Um, okay. So uh, what can we, people expect? Well, we sat down, 
just giving you some some backstory. We sat down and really wanted to put together um, just a little a little list of things that you guys could you know expect from us, um, things to hold ourselves accountable to, and goals of like you know who are the guests we want to line up for the show. Um, how do we want to put forth? content yeah. what is content that we will find applicable what are the what's the thing what are the things that you find applicable and appropriate yeah. and would like to to know about so we came up with a, a list um it's a small list but the first one is current trends within the church now um krista made a comment to me earlier <laughs> it was like don't be so hard on the church <laughs> i love the church i do she is the bride of christ i do love the church i can be a little heavy handed on the church. So I'm going to try and raise my hand and be a little lighter on her. But oh, I'm just like, we we are the bride of Christ. There, there's a high expectation there. Yeah. But um, what's currently happening in the church? What are the the highs and the lows? And how should we, one, um, you know, respond to those things yeah. and pray for those things and move forward in those things? What That's, do we do? What do we as a church doing well? What are some things where we need to improve? What are some areas we need to raise our awareness about? We've got a lot of ideas along those lines, but we want to keep our viewers up to date on what's happening in the church. You know, um, I did the video a few weeks ago on the revoice movement. We've been talking a lot about critical theory coming into the church, and we're going to continue those types of conversations. Um, so we want to keep people up to speed so they know that, Hey, if there's a big story uh, related to to the church, we're going to more than likely be talking about it. But if people want to know, they can always write to us and say, yeah. you know, hey, can you comment on this? Or I've been wondering what your thoughts are yeah. about this. I think we do things like critical race theory because we love the church. And yeah. because we love the church, we don't want errant doctrine to come in. Yeah. Um. What's the next one? You want to take the next one? Sure. The second thing we want to do this year is continue to help our listeners, our viewers know what's happening in the culture, mm -hmm. not just in the church, but also in the culture and, and talking about trends in the culture, but from a distinctly historic Christian uh, point of view. And, you know, there's so much happening in our culture. Christian parenting is changing. The kinds of conversations we have to have with our kids now as parents is changing. So we want to help equip people to be informed and know what's happening in the culture so that they can be talking to their kids and discipling the next generation. So people can count on us to um, be browsing social media um, and seeing what's happening out there. Cause we know that a lot of our viewers don't have time to sit around mm -hmm. and watch a bunch of podcasts and videos. And so we're kind of trying to help dis decipher like, what's really important. All right, let's talk about this or this. So. Yeah. I, I personally believe that when we in the church understand what's happening in culture, we can then take our voice out to the culture and be something that is sound and wise because we are biblically informed. Yeah. And so that is that, that goal. The next one is amazing guests. I don't know where I'm supposed to be looking. I'm looking over there, looking over here. Yeah. And we yes. do have some amazing guests lined up. We do. Oh, my gosh. I'm so excited about two guests that we have coming on soon. Um, Huge. Yes. Huge. Yes, yes, yes. I'm not going to reveal um, him just yet. I can't yet. tell you yet. He keeps switching the camera. He doesn't know like, who's ah! going to talk. <laughs> um, yes, I am so excited for two of these guests. And um, just thankful that the Lord opened the door and that they said yes. The conversations that we'll be having with them are very relevant and super important. Yes. So we're going to keep booking guests and people to come and talk about those current issues and trying to find experts and leading voices in those areas. So that's something people can pray for us for that, you know, the God will bring grace our way and people will come on our show and, yeah. and talk to, talk to us. Yeah. So influencers. Um, the next one is we want to continue to develop sources, resources to help people understand critical race theory. Yep. Um, you know, we might not cover that every week on the show. We try really hard not to turn this into all the race things. Yes. <laughs> we really try hard. Um, but we will continue to make side videos on critical race theory. We have eight 
or nine new videos coming in um, in just a couple of weeks. We're going to yeah. release a whole bunch of videos on one day that we've been recording and um, walking people through just the basics of critical race theory. And we're going to we have a lot more ideas for videos. So we want to continue to make resources that are accessible for lay people, for regular people, moms and dads and things that you can share with your friends and family. Yeah. So the next one is to be a stand for Christian unity. Um, I think culture is putting forward a very skewed version of what unity is and what it could be. And so we have some pretty clear cut definitions of what unity should look like in scripture. Yeah. And so we want to be a stand for that. And we're going to continue to to promote that. Then we want to be on our definition of unity coming right out of John 17 and Ephesians 4 that unified in our knowledge of Christ. We're not going to be unified in our feelings or unified in something vague. We're going to be unified in Christ growing in maturity and the knowledge of who he is. So we want to be a united uh, stand for preserving the, the faith once for all delivered to the saints. Yeah. So that's what we're going to be up to. And we just want to thank all of you so much for sharing our content. This show got eight shares so far. Wow. That could be like the highest we've ever had. Thank so you so much. Thank you for sh- hitting that share button. And we hope that you will continue to share. We're going to try to bring you awesome content. And um, just thanks to all those who have donated to the ministry and helping support us and helping us get new lights so that we can be lit better mm-hmm. and a better camera and better, better things, you know, and, you know, I mean, keeping it real because we are multicultural. <laughs> Sometimes it's like one is really bright and the other might not be seen or one. Yeah. So uh, these things that we're talking about is super important. Yeah. Um, you want to tell the business card story? <laughs> oh my goodness. We tried to get business cards for the show and we tried to have a picture of us on the business card. It's not that hard, it's- right? Apparently, machines don't know how to expose for an interracial picture. We got, we had them run it twice. The second one was better than the first one. The first one was horrible. You couldn't even see Monique. Yeah, like, it was. It was. I bad. was perfectly exposed. It was bad. <laughs> it was. It bad. was so bad. I was like, I think I'm here. But I mean, these are you know serious things. Yeah. Because I appreciate being seen. Um. And, you know, we laugh about it, but we thank you so So, much for your kindness and generosity. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and we uh, really want to, yeah, just thank our our supporters. You've helped us pay for the live streaming service. You've helped us pay for a new website for the show. Um, Just so much. And we're very grateful for that. We also want to, we've set a goal this year of speaking together four times. Yes. We're saying, four times. We're saying it in faith. Yes. One per quarter. Yes. That Monique and I are, are, are asking the Lord to send us four places this year to speak on critical race theory. Um, we have two of them lined up. Yes. Look well, at God. Yes. Look at God. We're going to be at the Women in Apologetics conference uh, coming up in just a couple of weeks. But we're all, uh, yeah, there it is. So if you can't join us locally, you can join us on the live stream. And our breakout session will be on the live stream. So you'll be able to catch what we're doing there. You can just go to womeninapologetics.com and join on the live stream. Maybe invite some friends over. Make make, yeah, invite make your it a group. viewing party. Yes. But we are asking the Lord to bring along some other opportunities. Yeah. So if you're running a women's conference or just a conference in general, or maybe uh, you you have a an adult Sunday school class that you teach or something, and you want Monique and I to to do something on critical race theory for your group. Think about it. Um, we really want to go to a, a church or Christian college, or even if maybe you're a pastor and you want uh, Monique to come and and do a training uh, and conversation for the church staff on race issues and. And how to help work with your pastor on on maybe making a good plan for um, racial unity or or maybe just to have some conversations on the staff about issues related to race. Um, yeah. She's she's um, open, open to it. Open yes, to I am. And it's because going back to what we said earlier, we love the church, and um, part of that love is being protective of the church and what comes into her doors and the people that are impacted by what comes in. 
So this is where that comes from. Yes. So that's what you can expect from us this year. And we look forward to your feedback about the show and topics you want to see covered. The last comment on YouTube. We're going to look at a comment. Um, do I, do you really want to be invited to Minnesota? Yeah, I've already been. It is a freezing. My but family lives there. I would love to come to Minnesota. Are they in, it starts with an E. They're in uh, the Twin Cities. Okay. Yeah. In, in a, in a diner. Uh, yeah, there it is. I'm, so, yes, I will come to Minnesota. I love Minnesota. Yes. If you get that set up, we will, we will come. <laughs> I cannot see with my glasses on. Okay. Maria also says, we switched back to homeschooling this year because we realized that our after school conversations couldn't keep up with all the with all that the culture is throwing at them every day. Boy, is that a powerful insight? Yeah. That is some very aware parenting. Yeah. So that's a good good thought. Check the comments one more time. I think yeah. we're clear. Okay, I think we're good. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. Thank you so much. We will see you next week. So excited. Be sure to check the show notes for past episodes and our new website at allthethingsshow.com. .com. Please share this show. That's um, our Instagram yeah. thing. You can oh, go there too. There it is that. Yes. I didn't even notice that. Yeah. We can go to Instagram. We have a Facebook page now, ATT live stream on Facebook, Instagram, and our website is all the things show. Oh, I need to change that graphic. So anyways, that's it. Remember to share the show with a friend and yeah. thanks for watching everyone. Bye. Good night.